Oh, one wash it, Jenny. Friday afternoon. Uh, Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon. And asked me if uh, I could preach uh, for him because they had long since planned this trip to get away. I think it was a good thing. It didn't because uh, if, if I had known it well ahead of time and announced that I was going to preach, we might not have had as many people in church. <laughs> called Pam this morning. Uh, Pam called Pam, I don't know which. But uh, and Pam made the statement that she was coming to church because John Whiteman was preaching. <laughs> and Pam's our pal said to her, well, Pam, I'm so glad you're coming. Now, uh, John Whitener has been fighting off the symptoms of COVID. He felt terrible. And he called up and called, told Bo that he wasn't able to come, but we are going to have another John preaching, uh, and his name is John D. Said uh, people call him John D, but D is not his last name. <laughs> A lot of people mistake that. Pam said, oh, no, I may stay home. <laughs> and I can just hear in the background, John was cranking out a prayer that said, Hush, woman, hush, woman. <laughs> John, you and I both have learned that it's better to crank those prayers out in silence <laughs> than to speak them out verbally. The Lord hears our prayer. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good thing for everybody to do. <laughs> but I was reading in seconds in First Samuel uh, one day last week, and I came out. I came to that twentieth chapter. It's a, a very, it's sort of a pivotal mark in this book. I love the historical books, and <clears throat> in this book, in this chapter, uh, <coughs> I find. <clears throat> this statement, there is but a step between me and death. Now, Mother was living with us, and Sue, uh, I had a wonderful mother, a lot of you knew her. She, she lived to be 90, past 97. And she had a rich and good life. She served as a missionary in the mountains of North Carolina for years. She adopted children up there, just took them in, didn't legally adopt them. When the flu epidemic came, Mother was still in the mountains up there. That place was so far back in the mountains of North Carolina that you took a train to go up to a certain place, and then you got off of the train, and you took a wagon, and went up to another little town, and then you got off the wagon, and you got on a mule, and then you went up to Plum Tree and went up to Cross North, and that's where the school was. And there was a Johnson family in this old community up there. They were an old, substantial family. They'd been there since the American Revolution. And this one family had many children, and the mother and father died with the flu just overnight. And I think three of the children died. And there maybe were seven children left. And uh, there was not a relative that could take those children. Finally, a cousin took the two boys. And they, the head of the school came to Mama and said, Miss Farr, could you watch over these girls until we can make some other arrangement? There were four girls, I think. <clears throat> and so my mother took the girls and she moved her cot out on the screen porch. She said she'd wake up in the morning and the snow on her cot 
on one end of it that was sticking out beyond where the screen was, that the snow would be three inches deep. And uh, the, she took these girls and she kept them for a little over a year. And they went to school and they loved her and, they, and what happened? Well, they lost touch with them as, as the years went by. Uh, <clears throat> and one day my mother was in a receiving line at the First Presbyterian Church in Montgomery. They had a new preacher that had come. And so they were, the Presbyterians are very formal about things like that. And they had the right kind of tea and the right kind of everything, and the, all of the silver was polished, and no paper plates or cups, and everything was done in the order that it should be done, and um, at the end of it, the preacher's wife came up and said to Mother, Miss Reese, I don't think you recognize me. And Mother said, well, dear, I don't know where I might have seen you before, you know. When you get as old as I am, you've met many people. And she said, well, I am Cora Johnson. Mother said, Mother, they both burst into tears and embraced. And they had not seen each other for more than 50 years. And this was the little girl that had come in, she and her sister, that the three girls came, and the other one slept on a pallet on the floor. But three of the girls slept in Mama's bed all winter, and none of the rest of them got the flu. Now, knowing my mother later, I don't know how, my, how she did that. She was an amazing person. My mother was so germ conscious that when um, she had a knife that fell on the floor in the kitchen and she turned on the oven and the gas stove and put the knife in there and forgot it and was sitting in the living room with my brother and all of a sudden there was this BOOM from the kitchen and that stuff that holds the handle of the blade into the handle had heated up and was trying to get out, the only way to get out was bust out. <laughs> and it busted out. She was, she would put, she was so germ conscious that if you, I, I'm surprised she didn't wash her hands today. <laughs> but uh, she dealt with death, death at that time, as she had many times in her life. And she saw the nearness of death. And she underlined in this Bible that I have right here, which is mine, she was using it down at our house, there is but a step between me and death. And you know that's where we sit this morning. Now let me read you the first few verses of chapter 20 of First Samuel. And David fled from Naoth and Ram, and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity? And what is my sin before thy father, that he seeketh my life? And he said unto him, God forbid, Jonathan says, God forbid that thou not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but that he will show me, and why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. And David swore moreover, and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death.
Now, all of us have had to deal with the devil. We've had people that we love dearly. And we felt that death would be untimely. It was not the time for them to death, to die. By his grace, God let me see when I was a, a, a teenager that that is not in our realm of choice. That nobody chooses the time of their death. We don't even choose the manner of our death. Death can be of somebody quite old. Someone asked me recently in an email, when do you think you will die? <laughs> and so why don't you go on and check out? <laughs> and I answered back, but I didn't have to answer much. I just said, when God is ready for me to come. And that's the truth. Uh, people look at death in different ways. I was a young boy preacher, 25 or 6, when I went to Ozark as pastor of the old Presbyterian Church. And I did that not through any spiritual message, no bowls of lightning or anything like that from the Lord, but it was in the Lord's will. And I knew that it was in the permissive will of God and for me to go to Ozark. I visited people in Ozark, some young girls that I'd been very interested in. Just the pretty girls. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> so I, I'd been in Ozark, a long, I stayed in Ozark a long time. But the, the, yeah, sometime during the first two weeks while I was there, we had a severe fall uh, storm. With thunder and lightning, and there were tornadoes around and everything else. And I had a telephone call. I was in my office down at the church, and the, the caregiver for the oldest member of the church, she was 86 or 7, her name was Miss Annie Brown. And Miss Brown had been one of 91 <coughs> cousins in a family. And she had measles when she was 10. And she told me that the first time I'd met her. She said, Miss Teresa, I had measles when I was 10 and I've never recovered. <laughs> I, a very severe case. And I thought to myself, I've known a hundred Annie Browns in my life. <laughs> and I keep meeting. Uh, and, but this, this call that came that day from Miss, from Miss Annie's caregiver, she was Mark uh, Weed's great aunt, Miss Destiny Connor. And she, uh, she said, Mr. Reese, you've got to come down here and get in the closet with Miss Brown. She's just insisting on me calling and telling you that. <laughs> I said, well, what? I said, well, I'll be down there, but I can promise you, I'm not getting in the closet. <laughs> and I got down there, and Miss Brown was in, in the closet. Brother Reese, come on in here and sit with me. I said, Miss Brown, I'm not coming in the closet. I might die. I said, well, you don't have anything to be afraid of. You know the Lord. Yeah, but I don't want to have to face him by myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you really am. Well, anyway, that's just one way of facing death. But I didn't go in the closet. All we needed in that little town was for it to get out that the preacher had gotten in the closet with the senior woman in the church. Oh, I've had a lot of funny experiences with people like that. And I found out that nobody 
has a clear understanding of death fully and completely. Some people have a fear of death. Some people are afraid of death, really afraid. Others think so lightly that there's, there's going to be nothing to it. Uh, frankly, I don't think of death very often. Uh, death to me is something that happens. And it's universal in that every one of us here, if we don't have any other experience in life that is the same type of experience, we're going to all go through death. And we're going to all meet the Lord after death. I haven't been through death and yet. And I will one day die. James says, I don't want you to die without me. And uh, I take the lead to you, but you can understand saying that ever since we married. Don't die and leave. I said, I, and when she was young and supple, and I thought, well, if I, if I die, you're as good looking as you are, you'll get somebody else. <laughs> uh, I won't bother her with that no longer. <laughs>
John D. my time has come. Hold on to me. I've been sitting out in the den with Charlie. She sent somebody out and I said, go tell John D. to come in here this time. And I went in and sat with her and stayed a few minutes. And that, that was the last thing she said to me. And I left a children. And then uh, Annette Akers died in March uh, of 20. Sweet Annette uh, had a victorious life. She had more heartache and tragedy in any one year of her life than I've had in my 92 plus years. And she lived in Dick. And death was a welcome release. She died and she had cancer. And for her, death was a welcome friend. A different kind of death. Uh, Jim Geyer died in April of 20. He was a hundred and what, one or two? A hundred and one. Lived a long life. He and Beverly were uh, together for a delightful twosome. And Beverly has gone on. She hadn't missed a beat and done everything else. And she is, uh, she has a little shepherd behind her that has a goat. <laughs> and takes care of her mama. And uh, her, her mama's a remarkable little lady. Gemma calls up to me. Well, how are you doing, Beverly? Oh, I'm just fine. Everything's going along so well. Pam is so sweet. She comes down and she takes care of a few of the things. And then I do so and so and so and so. And we, I, when I try to talk to her about something like that, I have to hold my hand over the phone because I'm almost laughing. I know Pam does everything but take your nap. <laughs> she has to. <clears throat> Bella is 95, 96? 96. 96. Uh, Shirley Moore died in mm. July, the 1st of July in 1920. Uh, our precious Sue Wilson died in this uh, two, a year ago this month with COVID. She's the only one in the church that has died with COVID. Uh, those other deaths, none of them came as a surprise. Shirley's death, I mean, uh, Sue's death came as a surprise. Sue was too much alive to die. Yeah. But that's from our human perception. Kevin Forehand died in yes. February of last year. Be coming up on a year right soon. Kevin was a wonderful boy. I was devoted to him like a son. And I think he loved me. But God put our hearts together. And it broke my heart when Kevin died. I know he's with the Lord. That's, right. That's the one in whom he had placed his trust. That's right. And I know that one day I'll see him and all these others again. And then Janet Kendall died the 4th of, uh, of, fourth of April in 21. Mm -hmm. Hadn't been quite a year yet. For years Janet was active in this church. And then we, I've already mentioned Russ Summer who died last October. And that's like a member of the church, the child of one of the members, and the brother of another member. And Milford Bass, Stanley's dad, 
and it wasn't expected, though he was old and had issues. But early in December, I think, I think the 13th, uh, Milford Bass, down in Phoenix Springs, breathed his legs and went to heaven. He didn't, his, his, death, his death itself was not difficult. The ones that suffer most in dying are those of us that mourn them because they are gone. I remember when Reese's grandmother died and he came home from the funeral and he was at our house the next few days and he said to uh, Jamie and me, he said, I don't want you to know to die. When you die, you don't come back. And I said, son, that's a good thing to learn. You don't. If you, are both, if you know the Lord and love him, you go where we're going to go. If you don't know him, we never will see you. But when you do know him, we take, maybe right that minute we can't do it, but you don't get far from it for we know that's where you are. And we know that one day we'll all be together again. Uh, my mother had a first cousin in North Carolina. She was not a likable person. Uh, she, <laughs> she was. <laughs> Everybody said I was saying, you know. She's smart and she can leave it out of class. She can feel and be around. Uh, and and she, had, she had one son. She had already rid herself of the fall. Uh, and I know he rejoiced with great joy when, when the papers were finally signed and that I saw him one time after that. I, he said, John Lee, how are you good? I said, fine. I said, how are you good? I hadn't seen you since y'all quit. He said, Lord, that was the best day in my life. <laughs> 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 they all have ten folks like that. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, uh, nobody had given her full credit. And my aunt was living with us at that time. Our children were little. She came to stay up 10 days with Jamie when I had a meeting somewhere. And uh, she stayed eight years. <laughs> <laughs> if y'all think you've had it bad in marriage, you can talk to Jamie. <laughs> and, uh, you know, after. That, and my aunt said, when she's the one, she found out first, somebody else, her sister-in-law had written, had sent up the announcement out of the paper of this young man's death. He was the captain of the football team. He was on the basketball team. He was on the baseball team that lived in the country. And uh, he was a fine-looking young man. He was 6'2 he was or something like that. Very popular, and he loved the Lord. He'd gotten wonderfully saved somewhere along the line. And he died when he was, sitting, he was 17 years old, I think. And my, my Aunt Johnson was reading that to us, and I said, my, my, Johnson, that was just too young for him to die. He didn't live long enough. Johnson said, oh, he lived long enough. Lived long enough to accept the Lord. And I thought, you've got a wonderful understanding. You live long enough to accept the Lord. And his mother, whom he would have thought wouldn't have known what to do with that, went to the funeral. I didn't go, but this was reported to me by my cousin. Said, John D., she went there, she stood up at the funeral and told the congregation, it's a wonderful thing that I know that he is with his Savior in heaven. And I know that for him, that's better than being with his mother who is such a pain. 
<laughs> well, she handled things better than a lot of noted Christians might handle. David, here in talking with Jonathan, was speaking of a situation at that time when he feared for his life, but he spoke a great timeless truth. And people don't like to think about death. We all ought to think about death and we ought to make plans so that our family will have an easier time when we die. Whatever we have done ahead of time is a great benefit to us if they precede us in death. So we should try to do that. And what Jonathan, what David was talking and saying to Jonathan is true in every age and it applies in any situation, no matter what it was, what it is. Several years ago, I was in line, a number of years ago, I was in line behind two fellows that were friends, and, that was, uh, and they were talking to each other, and one of them, they were older, and one of them said to the other one, said, you know, right here, right here in, in Dothan, 231 North, has become the most crowded highway in the state. And it is right, right, if you think about that. And the friend replied, that was when they were having that great battle, they were wanting to put in a lottery down on uh, 231 South. You remember that? And the friend replied to the guy that had spoken first, she said, this is nothing compared to how proud it is going to be if we become another Branson. I'm against that, the one of the other ones said. Now, I remember that conversation because I've been thinking of talking with you about another highway that I'm talking to you about this morning, and it's definitely more crowded than any other highway in the world and that is the highway of death. And we're going to all have to travel it. Some one way, some another. I, I saw on the computer last week sometime that about every four seconds somebody dies. That means that since I spoke my last sentence, Someone, somewhere, has closed out his account in this life, and he's gone. He's gone to face God's judgment in the next. Have you ever thought of it that according to the scripture, all men are going to go, have to go before judgment? the saved and the lost. We're going to all face the judgment of God after 